Um, so Lauren, can you just start off by telling us a little bit about um, kind of your background, where you're from, and how you got into playwriting? Sure, yeah. I'm from um, right outside of Atlanta, Georgia, a little liberal town called Decatur. Um, and I grew up in the Atlanta theater community thinking I wanted to be an actor and then quite kind of realized as I did a few shows that playwrights actually get to make the rules. <laughs> so <laughs> kind of realized, More true oh. in theater than in film, right? <laughs> Indeed. Um, yeah. And, uh, but the idea of choosing who the hero was, who the spotlight is on, who wins in the end and why, and just what, what we're putting forth in this kind of magical medium of theater. What do we focus on? What do we want to tell? And honestly, because I came as an actor, or wanting to be, um, I noticed a dearth of roles for women. So uh, yeah. I just thought, huh, maybe I can just write some. <laughs> Shockingly how simple <laughs> that idea is and turned into an entire career. So um, truly from that, that idea onward, it was a question of not if I will write, but what I'm gonna write about. Um, yeah. And so I, uh, undergraduate at Emory University and kind of oh my brother went there oh yeah great <laughs> yeah. they have a fabulous creative writing department and a really burgeoning theater department but there wasn't a playwriting track when I was there so I kind mm -hmm. of invented one they have one now <laughs> um, I kind of invented one and um, was acting and studying Shakespeare and studying southern literature and all those things kind of kept converging with my um, burgeoning feminism and mm -hmm. understanding the intersectionality and what diversity is on stage and so the plays kind of kept growing as I was learning, um, and I just never stopped. So I went to NYU for grad, grad school mm -hmm. where they teach you film, TV, and theater, um, okay. though, you, though you focus. And then um, uh, on to California. I did not intend to be a Californian, but uh -huh. I accidentally I, I think everyone who goes to NYU, I went to NYU for my undergrad, and I think everyone goes to NYU thinking that they're going to live in New York City for in the New York rest City of their mm -hmm. life. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So you're, um, it's like a, such a betrayal to go to California. <laughs> um, I know, but California, um, I found was better for me. Yeah, least. Um, that's great. So yeah, a career was born. I mean, it wasn't born here, but it was so um, fueled here because mm -hmm. I, I am in Ca uh, San Francisco and there's a, a wonderful theater community full of diverse sizes of theaters, different kinds, different focuses. And so there was one year, my first, second year or so here, where I had five new plays premiere just in San Francisco in one calendar wow. year. And so all of those plays, once they're premiered, they go in other theaters and yeah. then suddenly that's why I'm on that list. <laughs> yeah. <think> so. <laughs> yeah. And here we well, are. Still yes, writing. <laughs> yes, that's excellent. Um, and I know you have a great interest in science. You've written several plays about women in science. I'm curious, do you, do you have a science background, either yourself or, or someone in your family? Yeah, my husband is a preeminent virologist who specializes in pandemics. So he's, oh, so he's know very popular right now. <laughs> he actually literally is on the cover of Wired magazine for July and August. So go oh get a copy goodness. of Wired, read all about Nathan. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yes, um, I kind of collected scientists. I didn't mean to marry one, but I, I did. Uh, and I've always just loved it. I mean, that was my, com my conversation with myself was like, okay, I know I'm going to write. What do you write about? Mm -hmm. And I wrote my typical like self play, play sure, about Sure, as, as everyone does. <laughs> to do that, to like move on. Yep. Um, and then literally the next one was about Isaac Newton. And the next one is about a cosmologist, mathematical cosmologist named Ralph Alpher. And then Emily de Chatelet and Henrietta Leavitt and on and on and on in different um, fields. There is no shortage of incredible stories of women yeah. in sciences. So yes. Well, um, just quick pitch for Cardinal Stage. We were about to do Lauren's play Ada and the Engine before the pandemic shut us down, but hopefully we will be revisiting that piece next year when we're allowed to get together again. Go Ada. Um, but my, yeah, my cast was just thrilled and, and uh, heartbroken that they weren't able to, to tell this story, but the day will come. The day will come. That's a yes. fun one. It's so romantic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, thanks, Kati. Oh, uh, yeah. We just got a link. There's a link in the chat uh, to the Wired story yeah, about Lauren's husband. Wonderful. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about the taming. What was the impetus for writing this play? Yeah, this was in, um, this was Obama era. <laughs> and it Remember was, that? <laughs> remember those, when the hardest thing was the Senate and House being so, um, uh, obstructionist to him like mm -hmm. he was passing all this legislation and you know McConnell would shut it down and everybody would shut it down so that was my writing this frustration of partisan politics at that point um who knew how insane partisan politics that it could get worse <laughs> I thought I was like well peaked no 
Um, so anyway, it's, uh, but it was an exploration of that and that, you know, this kind of battle of the, the, pa the, the partisans reminded me of the battle of the sexes and kind of, mm. kind of best less worst example of that is Taming of the Shrew, where it is a literal battle, but it is a comedy about an abuser and it's terrible. And I'm always kind of, I love Shakespeare and I hate that place. So I was mm. like, let's, let's tear it apart. <laughs> so kind of taking the themes of that show and a lot of the character names and allusions to the characters um, and built this play. Uh, a radical political farce that has all women and mm -hmm. explores femininity and queerness and kind of, again, goes right into this heart of partisan divide where we assume we know things about each other and we assume how we're so different. Um, and we're assume that who's the bad guy and the good guy of the show, which it kind of flips and flops as the play goes on. So yeah, it, yeah. No one gets unscathed. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, so, okay. So that's interesting to hear that the like the house divided quite literally turned into the battle of the sexes. Okay, mm -hmm. I, was, I was curious to know like kind of where Shrew fit into this for you, but that that quite um, that makes sense. And the idea that it, there's a lot about that play that is funny until you kind of go, oh my god, he's like abusing her mentally, physically, starving her. He's like, wait, how is this funny? And it's kind of the same with, with politics. You're like, oh, ha ha, politics. And you're like, oh my God, people are like living and dying based on this legislation. And it's not quite as funny. No, but we so can funny still laugh at the time. And also the truth is I think so many of my comedies are comedies because comedy lets you in closer. It's, we laugh together, we're having a good time. The room is warm and welcoming. Um, and that means that people can kind of pay a little bit closer attention, I think, to mm. what is going mm. on. If it was a super, super serious drama, those can get <clears throat> heavy and preachy and all the things. But if we're making fun of everyone and everything the whole time, yeah. it's a little easier to attune your humor. And your your dialogue is so sharp all the time. That's <laughs> I, I was rereading again the other day and I love the lines about cats being witches. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cats I love the farce because it's just <laughs> like you can just say the craziest stuff. It's it's a delight. It, farces are and that kind of comedy incredibly hard to write because everything oh. is so specific. Um, that's what makes it funny and it has to be really fast. Um, but it is nothing like the joy of those first readings. <laughs> yeah. Kind of going. So, I'm having a great time. Is everyone else like it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about the process of putting this play together? Yeah, this was one where I point to as an example where I threw out the whole thing halfway through um, about a, six months or so before we were supposed to premiere it. It just, I couldn't make it work. And I realized I was so, I was clinging to the, the initial version of it, which mm -hmm. had, had so much, you know, copy, paste, delete, move. And right. finally, I just said, I know this story. I know these characters. I think that old draft is like holding me back. Mm -hmm. So I just literally was like, start a new Goodbye play didn't even look at it and just rewrote the whole thing and I think that's part of why this one has the flow that it does is because uh -huh. of all the messy drafts before it but yeah yeah starting fresh and going forth knowing where we're going um yeah yeah and really knowing your characters really well and working um, intimately the with the actors because these were really written for three bay area actors that I uh -huh. really trust and so writing for them um, and developing it with them means that I could count on their humor and their, yeah. um, their you know, conversation. They're all really smart actors. And so we would always talk a lot and I learned a ton from them and their, you know, improvs and explorations. Yeah. I was like, that's, that's funnier than what I wrote. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that sometimes like knowing who the actor is, who you're writing for, especially if you, if you know that person well, can also be extremely helpful to, to find your character's voice, right? Like, okay, yeah. I already I mean, know it's weird what these lines are going to sound like a little bit before they're set. Yeah, it's hard, though, because my job as a playwright is to actually not write for specific actors, because right. that's the whole magic of theater, right? It goes on, and there's been a thousand, you know, versions of this. There's been, maybe a thousand, a <laughs> hundred or so, um, uh, different actors taking on these roles. So you want to write it with generosity and openness so people mm -hmm. can bring themselves to it, but also kind of go like, mm, it's funnier if you say it like this. <laughs> yeah, I think you do an excellent job. And I, I, I hope that everyone noticed this as they were reading. Your stage directions are always amazing. Like the tone of the moment and, and the character's inner life is so vivid on the page. I think that that's really helpful for actors and makes it a really fun read. You know? Oh, good. Yeah, I, I really good. enjoy that. 
Um, so I'm curious to know, uh, you know, you just said that this show in and any show, if it's, you know, if you're lucky, if it's successful and goes on, gets done by a lot of people. I saw on your Tumblr that um, for the show that um, you gave the performance rights away on the day of Trump's inauguration. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of that event and what it was and how it went? Yeah. I mean, you all know it was like awful. <laughs> and so I was like, well, I do have a play about partisan politics and how like that's a bad choice, but we actually should all be able to come together and ends with like a happy, you know, a version of an happy integrated ending. Um, so yeah, it just occurred to me like give it away, let people do it if they want. And it was so heartening because, you know, some were like hundreds of people came to see a reading of it and some that's it was fantastic. like some people in their, <laughs> you know, backyard with their friends. Sure. Um, and everybody kind of did it and Ideally, if you were charging anything for it, it was a fundraiser for ACLU or Planned Parenthood. Oh, okay. A little bit of like an F you to Trump, not that he wouldn't notice, but the sense of like what theater does is it brings people together and at like a really dark, scary, uncertain day to kind of go, go to the theater, watch a comedy. You can laugh with other people and know that at least you have, you're starting to have a cohort. So yeah. the congregational yeah. aspect of theater was really important that day, at least to me. And we yeah. had, I don't know, like 50 or so, I, I can't remember actually how many hundred or something like that readings around the country. Nice. Yeah. It looked like the response was really amazing. I went to go see on, on the day after the election, I went to go see the legend of Georgia McBride. Oh, yeah. I already had tickets in advance and I, I almost couldn't bring myself to do it. And I was like, no, I'm going to go. And just sitting there watching the play in that moment, it, it had such an impact on me and, mm -hmm. and seeing my colleagues who were performing in the show, talking with them after the show and being like, it is important that we're here doing this play right now and, and seeing this play right now. Yeah, and, um, right. So I, I think I, I really admire that impulse. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, so how have you been reflecting on this piece in the wake of, you know, our current circumstances, um, especially thinking about the Black Lives Matter protests that have been going on and, and what it really means to kind of revisit the, the foundational documents of our country yeah. I mean, that's a tricky thing about this play because the, the, the jokes have to, some jokes have to shift quickly. Um, mm. You know, there was no, the last couple of big productions, we snuck in like a Bernie joke and, you know, you know, didn't, Trump is kind of all over it anyway. So I was like, I don't actually need a Trump joke here. Um, but, you know, kind of a whiffs of stuff going on. And I think now I would certainly put in a Black Lives Matter you know, maybe she's wearing a Black Lives Matter t-shirt or, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's up to a designer to kind of add some sure. of now to, you know, whatever productions. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, especially, I've been thinking actually a lot about that second act and the way it ends with, you know, Madison kind of being like, oh shit, we made right. a mistake. <laughs> no, I think this is not what we mean or certainly not what I mean. Right, and like we need to redo it every two like, years. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, and pick me us, of course, just like, sounds good, thanks guys. <laughs> you know, and they're like, no, oh no, we messed up. Um, which I think is America's, one of America's greater shames is feeling like the founders were perfect and yeah. treating them with this absolute superiority um, as though they could have had any knowledge of what the world would turn into. So yeah. I think anything that pokes fun at them is probably doing the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. We have a couple of questions from our guest. Cassie, do you want to take the first one? I'm going to, sure. Lauren, I'm going to take you off spotlight. <laughs> All um, right. Take it away, Cassie. All right. I was just wondering why you decided to frame the story around the Miss America pageant in terms of like, yeah. Yeah. Um, mainly because I was reading, I cannot remember the title of the book now, but it was comparing this kind of capitalistic notion and the founding kind of um, generative notions of what, how the country worked with beauty and femininity and this oppressiveness of, um, of, of female beauty. Um, and it felt perfect for Miss America. It's also called Miss America. <laughs> it's the idea also of kind of cutting under one of my favorite things about the show is that the like pretty buxom girl is the smartest of them all and right everybody and of course we think oh pretty equal stupid you know even if we try not to think that we do 
So that's one of the fun things about this show is her being like, also, I have a degree in constitutional law and it is very helpful. And you're like, oh my God, what? You got a degree in constitutional law? What are you? So there's all sorts of fun things of, of, of the, the subterfuge of that. Um, yeah, which I love. 